call the third session of annual town meeting 2022 to order. It's 8.04 p.m. on Monday, May 2nd. Tonight we're starting with a new performance of uh, the national anthem um, performed by, let's say, uh, I don't know if I have the pronunciation, let's say, I'm just getting word now. Uh, Ah, the uh, performance is by uh, Katya uh, Shubatkin, uh, who is a student at Arlington High School, class of 2022. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, Katya, for sharing your talent with us. Let's uh, so play the, uh, uh, the recording. Thank you, Katja. Um, and also a, sp a special thanks. It's like we're getting a double header. Um, uh, and a special thanks also to uh, Mark Tepline, who um, uh, connected us with Katja and her music teacher. So thank you, Mark. Um, so let me start with just some opening remarks. Uh, uh, I just want to speak to uh, uh, last Wednesday when we closed the meeting uh, like kind of overtime with Article 8, which had two amendments. Uh, I've gotten feedback from several uh, town meeting members that it wasn't entirely clear what we were voting on at certain points, especially the, the Klein Vakil Amendment, um, which had a bit of like kind of a, a double negative changing what was in an ineligibility list. And I apologize for any confusion about that. Going forward, I'm going to ask proponents, especially proponents of motions to amend, uh, to, uh, to more clearly explain the precise effect of their motions. Uh, a motion to amend amends a main motion, which often amends a bylaw. And so the layers of changes can be confusing. I'll strive to make that more clear, especially as we head into voting. At the same time, I would hope that uh, when we're debating an article and its subsidiary motions, whether it's uh, motions to amend or motions to substitute, uh, that it isn't the first time that, that members are reading it uh, to help to help uh, stay up to date with upcoming articles and their subsidiary motions, I published a progress dashboard that has the latest information at arlingtonma.gov slash town meeting progress. And this, this should have been in the town meeting member um, email list message uh, in recent days. And we'll have that at, at the top of, uh, of messages going forward to remind folks to look there. Uh, so that'll show you progress on articles we've already voted on and what's coming up. Uh, hopefully that makes it more clear uh, what homework town meeting members uh, you know, should be doing ahead of each meeting. Um, okay, so 
Uh, are there, let's see, by a show of hands, uh, can, can we enable uh, uh, raise hands in Zoom? Are there any town meeting members uh, who need to be sworn in? Like if you were unable to attend last week or, or you missed the swearing in last week on Monday and Wednesday, uh, do we have any hands to be sworn in as a town meeting member if you're newly elected or appointed to your seat? All right, I see one hand, okay. Um, so uh, Julie, can you bring up the oath of office? Okay, so uh, for anyone out there who needs to take the oath of office, uh, I see Sean Keen, if there's anyone else, uh, uh, just follow along as well. Uh, just repeat after me. Uh, I state your name, will participate fully and will fairly evaluate all matters before town meeting and vote in the best interests of the town. I support free speech and will treat others with mutual respect and will conduct myself in a civil manner that is becoming of an elected town meeting member. I do so solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon me as a town meeting member of the town of Arlington in accordance with the bylaws. Recording in progress. So help me God. Sorry, my Zoom window is kind of doing things here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Are we all set with the oath? Uh, was, was there anything else from, from the panel? We're good? Okay. Okay, I recognize uh, the chair of the select board, Len Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 4th, 2022 at 8 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, now call for any announcements or resolutions. Do we have any announcements or resolutions? And uh, let's make sure we have uh, raised hands enabled in Zoom for that. Okay, okay. seeing none, let's move on to, let's, see, let's call for uh, reports that are ready to be received. Um, Mr. Fosco. Um, Mr. Moderator, um, I move that Article 3 be removed from the table. Do you have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, Article 3 is now before us. We can now receive reports. Uh, let's see, we have three hands. Um, let's see, let's take uh, uh, Ms. Bloom. Second for Mr. Diggins's uh, movement to to move to Wednesday if it does, we don't fin finish. Yep, great, thank you. Yep, we, we, we have that covered, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, and uh, next we have uh, Mr. Thielman. Uh, good evening, Mr. Moderator, Jeff Thielman, Precinct 12. I wanna give the uh, Arlington High School Building Committee report and submit it to the town meeting. Please, please go ahead. Okay, I, I may go a little over four minutes if it's okay with the meeting, my apologies in advance. Um, so uh, first, uh, I'm pleased to prevent, pre present this report on behalf of the Arlington High School Building Committee. More than 2000 people toured the school on Saturday. We thank you and we hope you enjoyed our visit. Next slide, please. A reminder <clears throat> that Arlington High School is where we have Mononomy Preschool, district offices, 
community education programming, and of course our high school. And tonight I just wanna give you an overview uh, of where we are on the project. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We're pleased to report that the project is on schedule and on budget. Our students and teachers are in the new STEAM and performing arts wings on what was once the front lawn of the school, and they are thrilled to be using these beautiful spaces. Due to low interest rates and higher than anticipated premiums on our bond sales for the high school, the amount of tax increase for the average household is $100 less than the original estimate. In addition, in December of 2019, we locked into a guaranteed maximum price for the project, which meant we were not impacted by higher prices on goods and services due to inflation or to pandemic related shortages. Next slide, please. This slide shows the layout of the school. school. Next slide. In this slide, you can see each phase of construction and where students are attending school while work is taking place. Next slide. We opened the steam wing on schedule on February 28th and the auditorium opened on April 26th. Throughout the project, we have kept the public informed through our website and regular forums. Next slide, please. Phase one, which is open and operating, includes science classrooms and labs, art studios, maker spaces, and a 120 seat discourse lab. And it includes the performing arts wing, which has an 826 seat auditorium, dedicated and enlarged band and chorus rooms, eight music practice rooms, and a digital production lab and studio. Next slide, please. This gives you a view of the outside entrance of the school. And the next slide, gives you a view of the inside entrance of the school. Next slide, please. Next slide, this is the discourse lab. And then the next slide, please, is a picture of one of our science classrooms. The next slide is a picture of math and art rooms. The next slide is a view of the light well from the first floor. The next slide is a picture of one of the interdisciplinary maker spaces which many of you toured on Saturday. The next slide is a picture of the auditorium. And the next slide is a picture of the band room and the performing arts wing stairs. Next slide, please. We are now beginning phase two of construction. During this phase, we are taking down the old auditorium and column house, and we will be constructing the central spine, library, cafeteria, courtyard, humanities wing, district offices and Menominee Preschool. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see where we are building the humanities wing. Next slide, please. This slide shows the project two timeline. We are scheduled to open this wing in September of 2023. Next slide. This gives this you a Julie. view of how we are using existing space I'm all right. uh, as we begin phase two. The blue gym is now the cafeteria. The library is an old hall and the pit is now where students can study and spend time with one, one, one another. Next slide, please. This is a view of what the Mass Ave uh, Lobby and Life Sciences Skills Cafe will look like in September of 23. Next slide. This gives you a view of the forum stairs and cafeteria. Next slide. Here's a view of the new library. Next slide is a view of the courtyard. Next slide is a drawing of the exterior view of the humanities wing from Pierce Field. And the next slide is an interior and exterior view of the preschool. The next slide is a list of our committee. We have been working together in a collaborative way on behalf of the community for the past six years. We are all committed to seeing this project through to completion in 2025. Next slide, slide, please. If you have not done so, please go to our website and sign up for updates on the project. On behalf of our committee, I wanna to thank town meeting and the public for your support of this project that is transforming the educational experience of our students and offering beautiful and inviting spaces for the public at large to enjoy. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mr. Thielman. Uh, let's see, we have a hand raised uh, by Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe, do you have a report? Um, um, yes, Mr. Moderator, Clarissa Rowe, Precinct 4. I ask that the Community Preservation Act Committee's report be um, accepted by town meeting. It Please. is accepted. Uh, uh, do we? Yep. 
Oh, do we? I, I actually, do we need a second for that? I don't recall. Can we get a second just in case? Second. Okay, we have a second. Um, go ahead, Ms. Rock. Sorry. Um, no, I, I will. I'll be talking about this um, later in the warrant. Okay. Thank you. Report is received. Let's see. Uh, I see Mr. Thielman's hand is, I think, just still up from before. Um, are there any other uh, uh, any other reports that are ready to be received? All right, seeing none. Mr. Moderator? Yes, Mr. Fosca. I, I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. Uh, do we have a second? Second. OK, uh, Article 3 is now laid upon the table. Uh, so that brings us to uh, Article 9. Article 9 is now before the meeting. Um, so Article 9 uh, was uh, initially on the consent agenda. Um, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, has a recommended vote, <clears throat> excuse me, by the select board of no action. <clears throat> um, can we bring up the, um, yeah, can we bring up Article 9, please? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And let's see. And, and uh, let's see. Right, because we want to be able to allow. So, so uh, um, Mr. Warden uh, requested that this be removed from the consent agenda. Uh, and so I now ask for a uh, substitute. So basically, there are two uh, valid uh, actions that we could take from here. Uh, uh, someone can introduce a substitute motion, which I have not received in advance, uh, or uh, an explanation that maybe the uh, you know, the removal from the consent agenda happened um, uh, you know, incorrectly or uh, unintentionally, or there was some error. Um, so can we bring up Mr. Warden? Um, um, ideally, we would do this through the speaking queue so that we could actually see who's speaking and <clears throat> have a timer going. But um, and <clears throat> we have a point of order uh, from, from Mr. Miller. And I just want to remind everyone that this is a no action article, and uh, as far as I know, we still do not have a substitute motion. So. Um, Let's uh, let's all try not to burn too much time on this, please. Uh, Mr. Miller, are you there? Mr. Miller? Apologies. Yep, that was yes. a mistake on my part. Technology. Sorry. No worries. Uh, what, what is your point of order, sir? And uh, name and precinct, please. Oh, that, that was uh, precinct 11. That was actually relevant to the oath. Um, I, I'm a new member. Sorry. Sorry to hold up uh, the meeting. Uh, if, if you if you still need to, do you still need to take the oath of office? Is that what you're saying? Um, I. Well, I, I did it, but nobody heard me. But um, whatever is appropriate according to the meeting. Oh, okay, yeah. So we hadn't been uh, actually having people like uh, audibly, like on the call, giving the oath of office. It was just kind of like to yourself. So you oh, didn't. Actually... Okay. Yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll take it offline. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Apologies. No worries. Uh, and so we have uh, uh, Mr. Warden. Um, do you want to explain the uh, either a substitute motion or was there an error in? in this removal from the consent agenda. Thank the, you, Mr. Yes. My, my, my audible? Yes, I can hear you, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. Uh, to my knowledge, I did not uh, uh, ask uh, that this item be removed from the consent agenda. OK, so it I sounds like it's an error. So I don't, I don't know how my name got there. OK, thank you. So um, uh, seeing that there uh, Okay, and so looks like the speaking queue just cleared. There was someone there, but they disappeared. So seeing the speaking queue is cleared, uh, let's uh, let's take a, a vote on this. Actually, I'm just going to say uh, let's enable raise hands and Zoom so we can dispatch this really quickly. Um, if anyone has any uh, objections to 
uh, this recommended vote of no action by the select board on Article 9, bylaw amendment achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions from town facilities consistent with the town of Arlington's net zero um, uh, goals. Uh, do we have any objections? And if you have an objection, raise a hand in Zoom. And seeing none, uh, it's a unanimous vote that I declare. So uh, we are now done with Article 9. So let's move to Article 10. Okay. Article 10 is a bylaw amendment, uh, tree preservation and protection. And uh, the proponent that we'll bring up for this is uh, Ms. Stamps. So if we can open the speaker queue and or, or just have her come on directly. But if we have her on the speaker queue, then uh, then we can actually have the timer going as well. Oh, do you want me to head back over to the speaker queue? Oh, just so we could select you from there. If you if you could just, uh, we'll pull uh, you up anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It's just a, an extra okay. technical hurdle that makes things. Uh, like raise point of request. There we go. There we go. Yep. Okay, you can go ahead, uh, name and precinct. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Susan Stamps, Precinct 3, and a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. The Just a little bit of background, um, the select board created the Tree Committee in 2010 to promote the protection, planting, and care of trees in Arlington. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I have a slideshow. That was supposed to be the first slide. Oh, do we have it here? Is this we, it? Uh, yeah, I submitted it. Yep. Uh, Am I supposed to be on the Zoom? Sorry, everybody. The Zoom screen to look at the to see the slideshow. Oh, do you do you not see the Zoom window right now? Because that, that's where it's being uh, presented. Oh, I see. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, slide two, please. Next slide. In 2015 and 2016, the tree committee wrote the tree bylaw to address increasing loss of tree canopy in town from development. The 2016 town meeting passed it with almost unanimous support. This bylaw applies to major projects on residential and commercial property. Those major projects are one, demolitions, two, construction, increasing the footprint of structures 50% or more over pre-existing structures, and three, new construction on property with no pre-existing structures. The tree by law applies to trees defined as quote unquote protected trees on the property. Currently a protected tree is defined as a healthy tree located in the setback of the property with a minimum eight inch diameter. The, for anybody who doesn't know, the setback is the frame around the property. The, um, the minimum distance that a structure must be from a public way um, or a, a lot a, a, an adjacent um, lot line in Arlington the setback is any more anywhere from six feet to 25 feet depending on whether it's the front side or back of the structure or what kind of uh, property it is and what the zoning district is and so on so it's just those streets around, it's not any street on the property and a certain size, which currently is eight inches. If there are any protected trees on the property in one of these major projects, before during, doing any work on the property, the builder must submit a tree plan to the town's tree warden and have it approved. The tree plan has to show all the protected trees on the property. Um, the, I'm actually not ready for that third slide, but that's okay. Um, the tree plan must show all the protected trees on the property and nearby street trees. It must show which protected trees will be removed and how the roots of the remaining protected trees and nearby street trees will be protected during construction. If the builder plans to remove any protected trees, he or she must pay the town a mitigation fee of $375 per inch of total width lost. This um, and we um, that was that amount was determined by the um, town manager's office in consultation with um, other people at town hall and the tree warden as far as what is the cost of buying, planting, 
and caring for a tree for the first two or three years. And that turned out to be three, 375 inches per, um, uh, per inch, $375 per inch. This bylaw also applies to protected trees removed within 12 months before the builder or property owner applies for a building or a demolition permit. <clears throat> the money go, collected under the tree bylaw goes into the town's Trees Please Fund and is used to plant trees in the vicinity of the trees lost or elsewhere in town if planting locations near where they were taken down are limited. Next slide, please. The warrant article asks for poor changes in the tree bylaw, which will save time for the tree warden, the building department, and the builders. First, it tightens up the definition of demolition. Second, it increases the number of protected trees. Third, it makes the tree plans better for the tree warden. And four, it holds builders more accountable for knowledge of the tree bylaw. Next slide, please. Um, on the first item, of tightening up the definition of demolition. Currently, demolition is loosely defined as, and I'm paraphrasing here, removing a structure um, or starting to remove the structure. And this has caused an unknown number of disagreements with the building department, the tree warden, and, the, and among the, them and the builders over at what point does work on the property turn into demolition. And um, this was a real need. This needed to be straightened out. And so in consultation with the tree ward and the building department and the town manager's office, we came up with an extremely clear definition of demolition. Um, I, I won't read it to you here. If you want to look at the, the select board report, they are in favor of these four changes. Um, they have it right there, um, but it involves if you remove a roof, that's demolition. If you remove more than 50% of the wall area. That's definition, it's very clear. So that should pretty much remove those arguments. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the, we're looking to, we're asking the, the meeting to uh, reduce the size of protected trees from eight inches to six inches in diameter. Again, the select board is approves of all of these changes because we're still losing too much of our tree canopy to construction. I'm sure this is not news to anybody listening to this. And therefore this article um, would reduce. And so we're looking to reduce the, the, the width to six inches to save more trees. Um, the six inches is consistent with area town bylaws today. When we wrote our first wrote our tree bylaw in 2016, we looked around the country and around Massachusetts, and we found very few uh, bylaws that were regulating removal of trees during construction, but we found two good examples right in our backyard, Lexington and Wellesley. Um, and we really modeled our bylaw on them. And since 2016, both towns have reduced the size of the protected trees to six inches. Since then, some other towns have instituted tree bylaws, Cambridge and Concord have six inch and um, Somerville and Newton have new bylaws and they're at eight inches, but we think Arlington is very dense and six inches is certainly well within the norm and appropriate. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> the, the, and this is kind of geeky, but um, the, the tree plan that um, has to be submitted under the tree bylaw, um, because we allowed the builders to basically do the tree plan themselves just draw the trees on the, you know, the site plan they were, they were using or the construction plan they were using. And um, we, were, we were trying to make it not complicated, but what's happened is that um, builders are not tree people and they don't necessarily know how big a tree is or, you know, they, don't have, they, they can't identify them properly. Uh, I wouldn't be able to either. Um, there's something they're in the wrong place on the plan. And so it, it's caused a lot of delays and, and again, problems with getting on the same page as the tree warden so that they can get going with their project. Tree warden has to go out and take his own measure, measurements. And so this a requirement, um, this adds a requirement that a tree plan has to be uh, done by a certified arborist or registered landscape architect. And, um, it, you know, and I'm happy to report that there are some builders in town who actually do do that right now. Um, and so uh, that should be like really clear of that problem. And then the last thing is that sometimes somebody, especially a builder from out of town, will just go ahead and start 
um, doing a demolition or doing work, clearing property, and then when they come in and apply for their building permit, and somebody mentions the tree bylaw, they they say that, oh gosh, I oh I didn't know there was a tree bylaw. Well, oh I'm so sorry, I took those trees down, and um, what this excuse me that work is done after they apply for the building permit. They get the building permit, they do the work on the property, they don't realize there's a tree bylaw. Um, and so what this does is it adds an affidavit to the bottom of the building permit saying, um, I, the builder, um, certify that my project does not apply to the tree bylaw and I am aware that there's a tree bylaw. So it's right there for them so that if there is work done um, outside of the, the tree bylaw, then they can be held accountable and there really don't need to be any questions asked. And so those are the four changes that we're asking for. And so we hope that you will uh, vote yes on Article 10. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Stamps. Uh, we have another speaker in the queue. Let's take uh, Ms. Weber. Uh, name and precinct, please. Hi, Janice Weber, Precinct 21. I just wanted to ask Ms. Stamps if um, we have to get in touch with a tree committee if we have trees on our property that well, my neighbors think are going to fall on my house. I don't personally think that, but there's some small maple trees, and I wanted to know if we have to have permission to cut them down if the need comes about. Um, uh, Ms. Stamps, is that, is that within the scope of this of the changes uh, in this? Well, order? I, I would just, Mr. Moderator, um, I, I would just, um, if I have um, permission to give a very brief answer to Ms. Weber. To explain why it's not in the scope of the tree bylaw. Sure, you have six and a half minutes of Miss Weaver's time, but please don't use all that. No, no, I just simply to say that um, that the tree bylaw, as I explained in my presentation, only applies to major developments, demolition, oh. etc. So, a couple of trees on your property because you're having an issue. That's the, the tree bylaw doesn't apply. It's a good question. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's take Miss Gruber from the uh, speaking queue. Name and precinct. Once you're able to connect. Yes, Rebecca Gruber, precinct 10. I just had a quick question. Um, I know that everyone is aware that there's a lot of conversation about Warren Article 38. And uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, what demolition will occur um, under War Article 38, if it's uh, approved and supported. Um, in general, I guess my question is, um, it seems to me that your amendments um, will do more to protect trees from significant development on lots. Do I understand that correctly? Uh, Ms. Stamps, is that accurate? Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, it will in the sense that it, it protects a wider variety of trees um, with minimum tree size six inches. So it's going to include more trees than minimum, than down to minimum size eight inches. So yes, it will protect more trees. Thank you. Um, and I, I just wanna say that it's interesting to think about the warrant articles in connection to one another. Um, and in this case, of course, this particular warrant article is um, potentially going to help us as we think about other Warren articles regarding development of um, properties. Thank you. Great, thank you. Of course, since we do go through, let's take, um, uh, let's say Ms. May uh, Kluhout um, next. Um, let's just remember while, while we're uh, uh, bringing them up that uh, what's in scope is the articles that are before us, there are interactions between them, but it's it's the uh, responsibility of the select board mainly to put the sequencing of the articles. Um, so we, we can't think too much about the interactions of future articles um, when we're discussing this one. Go ahead. Um, name and precinct, uh, please. Uh, good evening, Mr. Moderator. Michaela May, precinct 20. I move to terminate debate on this article. Okay, do we have a second? And we have seconds. Okay, so let's uh, let's open uh, voting for uh, termination of debate. Okay. 
Okay, so if you are in favor of terminating debate on, um, on Article 10, you want to vote yes. If you want to continue debate on this article about uh, regulations for tree removal, uh, then you would vote no so we can continue debate. And this is a two thirds vote. It requires two thirds to terminate debate and then move to voting on the main motion. Oh, and I did not remind folks to vote in waves. I apologize for that. Um, and that's now gotten us into trouble. I will take a note of that. Make sure we do that going forward. I did put that in my notes for the main motion, but not for termination of debate. And I apologize for that. Okay. We're still missing several voters. So let's hold up a bit because I think there's been some issues with folks getting through to get their votes in. Uh, we're only seeing 160 votes cast, which is fairly low. Um, so let's, um, let's see. Yeah, there's several folks uh, who have zero idle time, which means that they've been active um, just now and have not submitted their vote or not been able to do that successfully. So let's just wait a bit. So this is the termination of debate on Article 10. Uh, okay, we're up to 216 votes cast. Um, some folks uh, who have not been idle, which means that they're active users in the portal, but have not got, gotten a vote through yet are Mr. Tremblay, Ms. McKinnon, Ms. Kelleher, Ms. Stamps, um, Mr. Zimmer, uh, Ms. Jean, Ms. Preston, Ms. Leahy. Okay, now we're up to 222 votes. We're getting there. So let's just wait a little bit longer as the votes are still coming in. We don't want to cut people off as there's active voting from several folks. Uh, Ms. Thornton, I see you on. Um, uh, your vote has not gotten in yet, according to my screen. Uh, Mr. Brody, Mr. Ames, uh, Mr. Kerbel, uh, Mr. Batts. Mr. Tremblay was idle negative minutes ago. I'm not sure how that's possible. Um, Ms. Farola. Uh, Ms. Preston, if you're having trouble voting uh, through the portal, you can anyone for that matter can enter their vote into the Q and A. Let's see, do we do we have the instructions up in the Q and A? Did that get through to folks about um, the various ways that you can get your votes in? And I, I should be verbalizing that away uh, as well. I apologize. Here we go. Uh, the, you can enter your vote into the Q and A if you're having trouble through the portal. And apologies again that I didn't send folks in waves. Um, or you can call the town clerk, Julie Brazil, at 781 316 3071. And the folks who, there's still a handful of folks Ms. Farola, uh, Ms. Sadat, uh, Ms. Preston. Uh, Okay, I see Ms. Preston's vote got in. Um, okay, let's just give another 15 seconds because it's just a few folks left. And this is for termination of debate. So, um, hold on. It's not gonna have any permanent consequences. Um, it's just like five more seconds to give folks just a little bit more time and apologies for the delays on this again. I'll make sure that we vote in waves next time. Okay, let's close voting now. Again, this is on termination of debate, not the main motion. Okay, and so the motion passes 206 in the, in the affirmative, 26 uh, in the negative. So debate is terminated. So let's just uh, run through the screens. And then after we're done running through the screens, we're going to take a vote on the main motion. 
um, which is the select board's recommended vote of favorable action on Article 10 bylaw amendment related to tree preservation and protection. And I'll, I'll detail what specifically, like, like a, a very, very brief uh, summary of what that means uh, when we get to the voting screen for the main motion. Right now, we're still looking at the, uh, the votes on the uh, termination of debate. OK, so we're done going through the, the precinct. So let's uh, open up the uh, voting for the main motion for Article 10. <laughs> And while that's coming up, uh, I'll just explain that a yes vote here means that we're, this is my summary, uh, it's, it's obviously oversimplified um, uh, because I'm not going to read the entirety of the, um, of the main motion, but very uh, a brief summary is that uh, vote yes if you want to tighten regulations around removal of trees to try to preserve the tree canopy in town and vote no if you want to remain with the status quo on the current tree removal regulations. Okay, and so let's first start with precincts one through seven. If you're not in precincts one through seven, hold off on voting please. Just precincts one through seven for now. All right. We'll just wait uh, about 20 seconds before we move on. So if you're precincts eight and above, please don't vote yet. Uh, okay, so if you're now if you're in precincts eight to 14, uh, please go ahead and vote. Again, uh, Vote yes if you want to tighten regulations around removal of trees to try to preserve the tree canopy in town, and vote no if you want to retain the status quo on the tree removal regulations. And so, okay, let's, and now if you're in precincts 15 to 21, please vote now. And we'll go for another 30 seconds, just to give everyone enough time. Okay, we still have several uh, members who, have, who are active in the portal, but have not voted yet. We have Mr. Tremblay, Ms. Noah, uh, Ms. Jean, Mr. Hamlin, Mr. Batts, Ms. Spear, Ms. Florent Hurtlow. Okay, now we just have three uh, missing voters. Uh, Mr. Hamlin, Mr. Batts, Ms. Farola. Okay, and so I think we've had enough time here. Let's close voting. Okay, the motion passes. 222 in the affirmative, 10 in the negative. Uh, uh, the main motion of Article 10 uh, passes. So let's run through the screens. Okay, so let's now open Article 11, bylaw amendment related to domestic partnerships. And okay, so it's a recommended vote of favorable action by the select board. And while that's coming up, uh, uh, let me just call on 
Uh, uh, let's see, before we get into this, uh, we have a point of order from Ms. Dre. Good evening, Mr. Moderator, Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 10. Um, I'm wondering before we get discussing this article, if you um, could let me know where I could find the policy that governs what is allowed to be posted on the Tom Warren. In my brief tenure, I've only seen amendments and reports posted on the town warrant until recently in regards to this article, there was an opinion piece that was attached. Um, I did ask more experienced town meeting members, but they were unable to help me. So I'm wondering if you could let me know where I could find that or if you could perhaps explain that policy. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Yep, thank you. So um, I'm gonna consider that out of scope for this particular article, but it's a, it's a very good question. I will make sure that in our communication going forward, hopefully by tomorrow, or at least in the coming days to, um, uh, specify that policy because I think that it hasn't been uh, uh, super precise what exactly the policy is for what gets posted there. Um, and so uh, I'll make sure that we communicate that. Um, thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so let's bring up. So we have, uh, uh, do we have that open here, Article 11? Okay. And so before uh, we get started here, let's uh, let me give. Uh, uh, the chair of the select board an opportunity to uh, Mr. Diggins, do you have anything to say about the recommended vote uh, from the select board on this? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and I want to Diggins, select board chair. And so the select board, we voted unanimously to support uh, this, this article. We, we support the, the expansion of the, um, that, excuse me. We we support the expansion of of rights being given to um, non traditional um, groupings. I mean, uh, so I, I want to say couples, but it's clearly not couples. But um, uh, relationships. I mean, and and so we we understand that there are I mean, some potential um, financial implications. I mean, um, uh, from potential abuse me but but we feel that there are ways to mitigate that or not so much mitigate that but but address it mean and so we feel that rather than be acting or not giving people more rights me out of concern in um for potential abuse be let's move forward and and deal with these problems as as they come up. Uh, and so um, uh, overall, though, we, we, we think it's a, a good article and that we can, um, we can, we can um, support it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, so let's bring up the uh, proponent of this article um, first. And so uh, can Ms. Ryan Volmar actually, can, can you add yourself to the speaking queue if you haven't already, and we'll just take you out of order that way we can we can show the timer um, so that it's more consistent with all the other speakers, even though we'll be taking it first. Um, is we're looking for Susan Ryan Volmar. Yep. Okay, so we'll just pull you up first. So uh, so you're the proponent. Do you want to uh, speak to this article and summarize what exactly this is changing and your motivations for this, please? Uh, sh sure. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> I'm Susan Ryan Volmar, town meeting member from Precinct 19. Uh I'm also one of the co-chairs of the Rainbow Commission, which placed Article 11 on the warrant. I'm here with Amos Meeks, a town meeting member from Precinct 3. Those of you who present for town meeting last year will remember Amos as the courageous driver of the town's groundbreaking domestic partnership bylaw. Arlington should be proud of being the first town in the state to enact a bylaw recognizing polyamorous relationships. Our bylaw was reviewed for any potential conflicts with state law by the Attorney General's office after passage. It was found to be entirely proper and legal. The most urgently needed benefit accorded through Arlington's domestic partnership bylaw is the right to visit your partner in the hospital. Some of the proposed changes to the town's bylaw and Article 11 affects, affect this right, so it's vital that Article 11 is approved. The push to legalize domestic partnerships in Massachusetts began in the late 1980s when an HIV infection was a death sentence. Many hospital administrators routinely denied visitation to partners of gay men dying of AIDS. So having a piece of paper in hand certifying that you had the legal right to visit your life partner as he lay dying was life-changing. Today, hospital administrators continue to turn away loved ones in non-traditional relationships. 
The first requirement to be able to visit a loved one or designate the loved ones who can visit you is for your relationship to be recognized in some official form. If you don't have that official recognition, you don't get hospital visitation. Under Arlington's domestic partnership bylaw, if one member of a partnership dies, then the entire partnership is dissolved. Article 11 will update that language so that the death of one partner will not dissolve the loving relationship of surviving members. Dissolving a polyamorous relationship even temporarily, such as between the time of one partner's death and the time when surviving partners can re-register, needlessly exposes loving partners to the emotional devastation of being turned away at the hospital door. Other changes to the town's domestic partnership bylaw that will be made with the passage of Article 11 include a new section on employment benefits that town employees and registered partnerships would be eligible for. Those benefits include paid bereavement, sick, and parental leave. These employment benefits will not cost the town any money. The number of days a town employee can take for parental leave is governed by state law. The number of days a town employee can take to care for the sick parent of a partner is governed by the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. The number of paid bereavement days an employee can take is five days per death. If an employee needs more time off than allotted for parental sick or bereavement leave, they must use accrued personal or vacation leave before taking unpaid leave. Town employees who register for a domestic partnership will not be able to extend their health insurance benefits to their domestic partners. That would violate state law. Since the domestic partnership bylaw was enacted, there have been three registered partnerships in Arlington. At $30 per registration, the town has collected $90. No town employee has registered. Finally, Article 11 would remove the provisions that people in registered domestic partnerships must share their living expenses and live together. It's true that these provisions are common in domestic partnership bylaws. That's how they made it into Arlington's bylaw in the first place. But the provenance of these provisions reside in the deep homophobia of the 1980s and 1990s. As a young news reporter in Boston, some of the first stories I ever covered were of the raucous Boston City Council hearings in the early 1990s, during which several different domestic partnership ordinances were debated. At those hearings, I heard every argument that's ever been made against any proposal whatsoever that would grant recognition to non-traditional relationships. By far the most ridiculous, yet strangely effective argument was the claim that heterosexual employees would pretend to be gay in order to extend their health benefits to friends and family. To counter this anticipated onslaught of fraud, it became common for municipalities and businesses to impose stringent requirements on employees seeking domestic partnership benefits. That's why it's much harder to register for a domestic partnership than to get a license to marry. If you want to get a marriage license at Arlington Town Hall, you show up with your future spouse, prove that you're over the age of 18, fill out an intent to marry form, pay a $30 registration fee. To register... For a domestic partnership, all partners must come to the city uh, town hall, pay the registration fee, and, quote, jointly proclaim under the pains and penalties of perjury that they have made a commitment of mutual support and caring for the domestic partners, that they reside together and intend to do so indefinitely, and that they share basic living expenses. When compared with the strength of protection offered by marriage, domestic partnerships are like soggy pieces of spaghetti. It makes no sense to impose greater eligibility requirements on people seeking to register their domestic partnership than those seeking a license to marry. I want to conclude my introduction to Article 11 by expressing my deepest empathy for Amos and his family. My wife and I met in college when we were 18. We became parents after we'd been together for 20 years. I could speak for days describing the insults and injuries, which include denial of hospital visitation, that we endured throughout the horrible time when our relationship had no legal protection. We spent tens of thousands of dollars throughout those years on legal fees to adopt children I had given birth to, legal fees on domestic partnerships and other arrangements such as healthcare proxies and power of attorney we would not have needed if our relationship was legally recognized. In addition to those literal costs, there are other costs in which no price can be attached. The cost to your own sense of well-being and the toll on your relationship when it isn't recognized by healthcare providers, town clerks, tax accountants, and sometimes even members of your own family. It is shameful that town meeting has any power whatsoever over Amos's family. No member of town meeting meeting has earned that power or deserves that power any more so than the representatives who debated marriage equality in Massachusetts had done anything to warrant the power they once wielded over my family. But this is where we are, this is how things work. Since I'm a member of town meeting and I do have this power, I intend to exercise it judiciously and with humility. I urge each of you in the strongest possible terms to do the same. 
please reject the Moore Amendment. It may have originated with the best of intentions for the town, but it's rooted in a legacy of homophobia. It's based on a complete lack of understanding of the laws governing paid parental and family and medical leave. Please support Article 11. It is the least we can do for Amos, his family, and our other neighbors who need this recognition and protection. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ryan Volmar. Um, and uh, as she referenced, we, we do have one amendment uh, that's uh, been proposed. Uh, can we take up uh, Mr. Moore, please? Uh, he's, I believe, in the eighth position uh, to introduce uh, his amendment. Uh, is there something, I believe there's an amendment you want to move to introduce, Mr. Moore? Yes, Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move to amend the select board's motion under Article 11 uh, with the text that's been distributed before the meeting. Do we have a second? Okay, we have a second. And uh, Mr. Moore, do you want to speak to your amendment and, and what, what exactly it would change in the main motion? I'd be happy to. There's a point of order if you want to address it oh, first. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I saw that earlier. I apologize. Thanks. Thanks for noticing that. Uh, could we take a point of order from Mr. Kepline, please? Hi. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, a little, it was a technical problem. I was, I put in first, I was the first one you know, on the speaking list, and then suddenly I was gone from it. I was, well, I don't know, did, how did that happen? Or when does it get cleared? Or do I have to keep an eagle eye for when these flushes happen? I'm not aware, we'll, we'll take that question offline and we'll keep an eye on that and we'll have someone investigate that, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm sure someone from the staff on the panel can, can look into that, please. Um, Okay, uh, Mr. Moore, let's uh, uh, let's bring Mr. Moore back up. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I think what we're talking about here is not rights. We don't have any power over anybody's family or anybody's relationships. We can't tell them what to do. What we are talking about is providing benefits in law, and if those benefits should be limited, and how. It's not about rights, it's about benefits. I appreciate much of the change that's proposed in the select board's main motion under this article, in particular, the extension of benefits to town employees who are members of domestic partnerships. As a previous speaker said, we can't presently provide healthcare to members of domestic partnerships due to state law preemption issues, but I hope that that will change at some point in the future. Unfun unfortunately, um, one thing that's very important here is that the definition of what a domestic partnership is has been significantly changed in the main motion by removing the requirements that members of the partnership reside together and intend to do so indefinitely, share basic living expenses, and that they are not married. Now, the previous speaker commented that marriages don't have these kinds of requirements, and that's quite true, of course, but there are some other differences. For instance, marriages are limited to two people and that they may not, and those people may not participate in other marriages. In this case, if the main motion passes without my amendment, um, we really only have two substantive requirements that the members of the, the domestic partnership have a commitment of mutual support and caring, and that they're not related by blood closer than would bar marriage in the Commonwealth. They also have to be 18 and, and legally competent. Um, so the main motion would allow for partnerships of unlimited size consisting of any number of married or unmarried people living separately or together, and even people who are members of other domestic partnerships or marriages or who live in other states. Uh, it's very broad with no real limits to how large these partnerships or partnership networks could be. That leads the proposal to easy abuse. For instance, any number of married or unmarried couples living separately could be a partnership, and if any one of them were a town employee, that person would be entitled to parental leave for every child born to any member of the partnership. That leave, as the previous speaker mentioned, is limited in various ways, but the number of potential births triggering leave, for instance, uh, is limited only to the creativity of <laughs> the size of the partnership. Um, and you know, I hope at some point, uh, paid parental leave for uh, town employees becomes much more generous, but we can't afford to do that if the partnerships become large and diffuse. So rather than waiting for abuse to happen, I think we should foreclose that possibility. In my, my mind, the simplest way to accomplish that 
is to at least implicitly limit the scope of the partnerships. My motion does that by restoring the basic requirements of living together and sharing basic living expenses. Um, and um, it does not restore the requirement of not being married. Uh, I think that uh, there are very good reasons to not restore that requirement. Um, but restoring uh, the requirement to living together and sharing basic living expenses will limit abuse, keep the scale reasonable, and make it easier to expand benefits to partnerships should we choose to do so at some point in the future. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you. And it's now that we have the main motion and the um, motion to amend um, um, that have been uh, proposed uh, and, and spoken to will now kind of open up uh, speaking queue uh, to everyone else, uh, or we'll, we'll start taking folks from the speaking queue that's been filling up already. Um, so, and then when we're done with debate, um, eventually, then we'll we'll vote on the uh, Mr. Moore's uh, amendment, and uh, and then we'll vote on the main motion, which will either be amended or or not. Um, so let's now take uh, Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, this is Amos Meeks from Precinct Three. Um, I want to start just sort of on a slightly personal note. Um, I'm a scientist. I live in a world of facts and figures and theories and hypotheses. I try to bring this ethos to my work as a town meeting member and before that to my work as the co-chair of Sustainable Arlington. And I think this is part, part of why I've personally struggled with various conversations that I've had around this article over the past week. Um, I've talked to numerous town meeting members, spending many hours writing emails, talking on the phone, trying to understand and address their concerns with this article. Yet in every case, I didn't feel like any progress was made. And it took me until today to, I think, understand why. Um, and this is that, as far as I can tell, a lot of the pushback um, in the people that I talk to seems to be driven by fear mongering. Um, while I understand um, the motivation behind uh, Mr. Moore's um, uh, proposed amendment, um, he seems to be suggesting that we should deny domestic partnerships to a large group of people who may um, want or need them out of a fear that some potential town employee could somehow abuse this bylaw to spend all of their hard earned sick and personal time at once uh, for the year at a relatively unplanned time whenever someone has, some has, has a birth, for instance, um, or that they may then go on to harm the town by taking further unpaid leave uh, when not actually caring for a newborn or a loved one as is the uh, intended purpose of these benefits. Um, and I hope I don't have to explain why it's hard to imagine someone using this, these changes to abuse the five paid vacation days given for bereavement leave. I believe that at heart, this is fear mongering. In the letter published by town meeting members Stamps and Mann, they advocate opposing this entire set of changes um, out of a fear that these changes may have the unintended consequence of turning employers against current policies, extending benefits to people in domestic partnerships. Yet to me, this seems like pure speculation. And if that is truly their concern, I'm confused why they don't support the current changes that, they, that we are working on, and then also support the many next steps and advocacy that it would take towards broadening them and ensuring employers are support. Um, to impose the entire article on the grounds of an unsupported uh, speculative situation seems like fear mongering to me. I've had other conversations this past week that I won't address publicly because they were not, have not been brought up publicly, but the theme of them is the same. I find that someone opposes these changes out of a fear of some bad outcome, an outcome that I certainly also do not want, but there is no evidence provided that such an outcome would ever occur as a result of these changes nor are there any suggestions for how to modify the bylaw to try to mitigate these negative outcomes while still providing the benefits. This is simply fear mongering and opposition. So to all of these people and to anyone here tonight who feels similar, similarly to them, I would like to say that I'm sorry. I know what it's like to live in fear. Based on real situations, I've had to live in fear that if I told my boss about the people I love most in the world, that I could be fired for it. When thinking about whether or not to have a child, I've had to consider that the fear, based on the experience of people I know, that my family situation could be used to justify taking that child away from me or to justify denying an adoption. 
I've had to live in fear of answering basic questions like how was your weekend and instead monitoring every, monitoring every word to avoid coming out inadvertently and dealing with the potential questions and judgment that come with that. I've had to live in fear of then coming out publicly to several hundred town meeting members having no idea what kind of things could be said or done to me as a result. So I'm sorry, I did not want to be this person in this position. I think I'm far from the best person to be trying to represent the interests of a broad swath of people in a large variety of family situations. I would honestly be much happier being able to spend my time and energy and expertise focusing on environmental issues. I had been fully expecting to live my entire life in the closet and I had come to terms with that. But when the opportunity presented itself after Somerville's ordinance, and when I looked at my situation and found that I was in a position where I didn't need to worry about my job, I didn't have children I needed to protect, and where I could take any mean or hateful things said at me. I was in a position to do good and help my friends, my family, and my community. I didn't want to do it, it was scary, but who would I be if I hadn't? So again, I'm sorry, deeply sorry, for bringing these issues up and for causing fear and discomfort. While it would be too late to impact the vote tonight, I would like to extend to anyone who feels uncomfortable with these changes proposed here, an open invitation to come have tea in my backyard and meet my family. My email is publicly available if you want to get in touch. I also hope that you will have time to consider what you are really afraid of and to sit with that fear, but not to let it get in the way of providing this small set of legal rights and recognition to those who desire it. Um, with my remaining time, I would like to thank Susan Ryan Volmar and the rest of the Rainbow Commission for their support. I would like to thank the town clerk, Julie Brazil, for spending extensive time working with me to craft the administrative aspects of these changes. And I would like to thank the town council and the director of HR, Karen Malloy, for being responsive to my questions. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Mr. Meeks. And apologies to the meeting that the, uh, the timer got accidentally reset when we tried to clear the, the seconds, uh, um, the second requests from earlier. Um, but uh, I believe Mr. Meeks was well within his seven minutes. Um, as, before we move on, and this isn't directed at any particular speakers, I'm just uh, based on uh, discussions that have happened kind of uh, ahead of the meeting about this particular article. Um, this evening came up, I believe, in like an address rehearsal. Um, uh, lots of folks are interested in, in speaking on this from various different perspectives, uh, some very deeply personal perspectives, some practical perspectives, some academic perspectives. Um, and whatever, whatever angle you're kind of coming at this issue from, I just uh, I implore everybody uh, to really be mindful uh, and respectful of the really broad diversity of viewpoints on this issue. And just imagine that folks who disagree with you, imagine them actually sitting in your presence as opposed to just speaking into a computer, which can be very impersonal. Because um, this is a very personal subject uh, for a lot of folks, whichever side of, of this issue you happen to sit on. So please be mindful and thoughtful uh, and civil uh, when, when you speak on this issue. And again, that's not directed at anyone who's spoken already. Uh, just something for it to keep in mind, because uh, I know that there's a great diversity of views on this. Uh, so let's take uh, Mr. Newton next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This is Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. Uh, I'd like to confirm my understanding with Ms. Ryan Volmar, whether there's any possible way that Article 11 could put marriage equality gains at risk or impede Arlington's efforts to advance equity, justice, and access efforts. Uh, Ms. Ryan Volmar, uh, if, if uh... So you should be able to speak still. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the question. Um, you know what, I was in touch today with Mary Bonato to ask how and or whether any of these changes would somehow affect marriage law. And for members of town meeting who don't know who Mary Bonato is, um, Ms. Bonato, she's best known for being the lead counsel in the Goodridge case, which made Massachusetts the first state in which same-sex couples could marry in 2004. She was the architect of the legal strategy that dismantled the, the Defense of Marriage Act in 2013's Windsor case, which was decided by the United States Supreme Court, finding that the federal government had to recognize and honor the state marriages of same-sex couples. She also argued the Obergefell case before the United States Supreme Court in 2015, and that case found that state bans on same-sex marriage were unconstitutional. Ms. Bonato is one of the foremost experts in the country on marriage law. Um, so as I noted, I was in touch with her today about this issue. Um, <clears throat> we had an email exchange in which I have to, you know, preface this by saying she was careful to note that she was not all capital N-O-T, not offering a legal opinion. And she was in fact just quote spitballing. But I think um, the quality of Ms. Bonato's spitballing is 
very high. Um, she pointed out that thanks to the Windsor and Obergefell rulings, it's much harder for states to make changes to marriage laws. Any attempts to change marriage laws are likely to be met with preemptive litigation, and that's litigation asserting that federal law supplants state law. Um, so the idea that the town's domestic partnership bylaw would somehow have unintended consequences for marriage and marriage equality does not hold water, at least as Ms. Bonato sees it. Um, she did make the observation that as per usual, there will be some people who would try to quote, spin it as how we've undermined marriage norms, um, which I took to mean that any changes to recognition of non-traditional re relationships will be somehow interpreted as threatening the status quo, which, which quite frankly, I think is evidenced in the Moore Amendment and the uh, man uh, stamps uh, letter. Um, the other thing I wanna note is that the select board unanimously supported the Rainbow Commission's decision to put Article 11 on the warrant, and in its commentary on the article, the board noted that it, quote, recognizes that the proposed amendments to the bylaw, if adopted by the 2022 annual town meeting, will be subject to review by the Massachusetts Attorney General's Municipal Law Unit. Um, so people need to understand that if Article 11 passes, um, it will be reviewed. And any portions of the bylaw that are held invalid will simply be severed from the bylaw, while other provisions will remain in effect. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you, Ms. Ryan Volmar. Um, thank you for that clarification. Uh, I will be voting against the Moore Amendment. I, I do not share his fears, and I'm I'm happy to support this article. Uh, as has already been stated, it is the absolute least we can do for Mr. Meeks his family, and our other neighbors who need this recognition. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Uh, let's take uh, Mr. Tosti. Um, name and precinct, please. Mr. Tosti, are you able to unmute? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, fellow town meeting members, last year we instituted this bylaw. But name is precinct, I'm sorry. It was fairly limited, uh, seemed okay. Town meeting then expanded it to three or more, which I thought was a bit strange. Most people struggle to keep a marriage or relationship of two going, never mind more than that, but it passed. This year, we're seeing a whole new rewrite that throws out virtually all limitations and now includes public benefits. This bylaw should be honest and change the title from domestic partnership to pretty much anybody. Now, if you go to the dictionary and you look at domestic, it reads of or pertaining to the home, family or household affairs devoted to home life, there's nothing domestic about this proposal. Item two, which means people live together and have a long-term commitment is gone. Item three, which share, main, maintains that they share basic living expenses is gone. Item four, that you can't be married to somebody else is gone. All that is left is you have to care for each other, be 18 or competent, and not be a brother or sister by blood. That is a pretty loose definition. It's almost useless. Now we're adding to this public benefits. Section six adds for town employees, bereavement leave with pay, sick leave to care for partners and parental leave. This is not a huge cost, but there will be a cost. If somebody is not there, the town has to provide somebody else to do the work, often at overtime uh, on these, especially in public safety. But the pattern has now been established for public benefits. Next year, if it can be done legally, I guarantee that health insurance will be next, and that will be a huge cost. This Mr. Tosti, let's uh, not speculate about future changes, because that's, that's clearly out of scope. So let's, let's try to keep it focused on, on, on this particular. talking about time. public benefits, Mr. Moderator. Right, and, and, and health care is not, is not addressed in this article, correct? I think I should be able to speak my piece, sir. Okay, go ahead. This proposal guts the definition of who qualifies 
and reaches into establishing public benefits. I urge you to reject this and far reaching and unreasonable proposal and leave the bylaw as it is. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Mr. Tosti. Uh, let's take uh, Ms. Gittleson next. Thank you, this is Laura Gittleson, town meeting member, precinct 17. Um, I, would, I would like to ask the proponent to talk uh, maybe more specifically about what benefits would be conferred as a result of uh, passing Article 11 without the amendment. Uh, Ms. Ryan Volmar, can you answer uh, Ms. Ms. Gittleson's question? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, just to talk about the public benefits piece for uh, municipal employees. Um, as, as I noted in my remarks, I won't repeat them, but it, it's basically paid parental uh, sick and bereavement leave. Um, the vast majority of town employees do not incur additional labor costs when they take these, these sorts of leaves because there's no requirement that town positions are backfilled unless they're public safety jobs such as police or fire. Um, you know, so so the fear of, of wild co escalating costs, you know, it's simply um, not based in reality. Um, and again, as, as noted previously, the additional number of days of leave that an employee can take for parental leave is determined by state law. Eligibility for sick leave uh, is determined by federal law. And will not be affected by this amendment, uh, by uh, Article 11, excuse me. Ms. Gittleson, did you have anything else? I did. Um, I, I wanted to know, you know, given all of that and given the proponents uh, characterizing the strength of domestic partnerships as akin to, I think it was overcooked spaghetti, if the only thing that can really be counted on is for hospital, hospital visitation, is this whole exercise worth it? Is it worth the unintended consequences that I agree with Mr. Meeks about are actually fear mongering. Um, I really appreciate that question um, because uh, the the benefits accorded to um, people who are registered as domestic partnerships in Arlington are minuscule. They're scant. They're like the barest hint of a whisper as compared to the benefits of marriage. Um, speaking as somebody who had to deal with um, being denied hospital visitation because my relationship was not recognized, I would say, yes, absolutely, this fight is worth it. If you haven't experienced that personally, it is devastating, um, extremely painful, um, and you're completely helpless. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, so if we can, at minimum, provide that, um, benefit to Amos and his family and um, other folks in Arlington who've registered for domestic partnerships, it is 100% absolutely worth doing. Ms. Gittleson, do you have anything else? Yes, I will just say that I will be voting against the Moore Amendment and for the main article for many of the same reasons referred to by Mr. Meeks, Ms. Ryan Volmar, and Mr. Newton. I'd also like to say that uh, I think that Mr. Tosti was cherry picking the definition of domestic, because if you look at Merriam-Webster, one, one of the definitions is of or relating to the household or the family. What we're talking about here is family. Ms. Ms. Gittleson, let me interrupt to say, like, like we, we can speak to the merits of arguments that others have made, but let, let's uh, try not to focus on like the individuals who okay, presented. Okay, I apologize, yep. I apologize. Go ahead. My point is that the definition of domestic includes a definition of or relating to the household or the family. And what we're talking about here is families. We're talking about Amos's family. We're, we're talking about uh, many other unknown families in Arlington, and that's why I'm gonna support it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ms. Ms. Gittleson. Uh, we have a point order, order from Mr. Jameson. Uh, yes, Mr. Moderator, Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. 
Um, just quickly, I would remind the, the members that uh, when addressing the moderator that you should uh, give your name and precinct. Um, number two, it is solely in the moderator's um, purview as to who responds. Yep. And, and three, I can't remember. Um, but thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Great. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. I was actually going to point out those two very things. Um, and now I don't need to because Mr. Jameson's already done it. Uh, all questions, but just to reiterate, all, like all questions should be directed through me. It's a little weird and annoying. It's not the normal flow of conversations, but that's kind of the point to kind of have things moderated, right? And so uh, thank you for that reminder. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have another point of order from Ms. Stamps. Okay, um, thank you. Um, is it is it name, name and precinct? Susan Stamps, Precinct Three. Um, is it proper to point out that people are misrepresenting the current domestic partnership um, bylaw on the books in Arlington as we speak? That it already gives domestic partners visitation rights at healthcare facilities and at um, I would say, facilities. Let me just, I'll just stop you there, Ms. Stamps. Uh, yeah, that's it. That, that is out of scope for a. Uh, or it's it's out of order for a point of order um, uh, that that should really come up in the uh, uh, in the content of uh, remarks by those in the speaking queue uh, to speak well, to. I, the, I, everybody the, seems to not know that, you, you know, Mr. Moderator. So I thought it was important to point. That but it's out possible for everyone in the speaking queue to have incorrect facts about something that aren't being corrected, and that's just kind of that's always the risk of democracy, right? That um, it's based on. The, the information that people have. And so obviously the best antidote to that is an informed electorate and there are gonna be limitations to the level of information that people have. Uh, but I appreciate the point, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Um, and so let's take uh, Ms. Henkin next. Uh, and as Mr. Jameson pointed out, please uh, uh, offer your name and precinct before you begin. Hi, Anna Henkin, precinct six. Um, I really want to speak in support of this main motion as it stands without the amendment. Um, in particular, requiring people to reside together indefinitely isn't required for marriages. Um, and I also don't have to share finances with my husband. Um, but I'm in my early 30s and a lot of people in my age group often can't afford financially to live with their longtime partner or partners, um, whether they have to get a job across state lines for a year or two, or they need to spend months or years caring for an ailing parent while still being in a long-term committed relationship, or even being on military or Peace Corps deployment. There are many, many important reasons why people might not just be living together, or perhaps they're just terrible roommates but love each other a lot and are truly committed for a very long time to each other and to be in each other's lives. And it doesn't eliminate that strong commitment or the validity of those partners' partnerships. Um, and I don't think that we should be calling into question the validity of their relationships, putting in jeopardy their ability to visit each other in the hospital, take care of their communal children or have bereavement leave. <laughs> um, and I really just want to speak in support of the main motion. Um, a lot of the arguments I keep hearing against it remind me of things like the myth of the welfare queen, committing fraud in a Cadillac on food stamps. This is, this is bereavement leave. This is getting to take care of your newborn child. This is getting to see your loved one in the hospital. This is human need. And these imaginary boogeymen of people committing fraud and defrauding the town are really obscuring, just extending support to people to take care of the other people that they love, which I think is one of the most beautiful things that humans do. Um, so that's me speaking my piece. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Henkin. Uh, let's take Mr. Foskett next. Name and precinct, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. Uh, Mr. Moderator, first of all, I, 
I would like to object to some of the speakers who seem to want to demonize anybody who might not agree with them. With Mr. Terms, Ruskin, is, it possible to, is, it, is it possible to reframe that as objecting to the merits of arguments that have been given as opposed to objecting to the individuals? Um, however you would like to phrase it, sir, uh, but being accused of fear-mongering as a patent remark, I think is um, somewhat insulting, okay? Um, I have a couple of questions uh, well, for, for Mr. Heim. Okay. Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Moderator. Sure, sure. Um, and that is uh, the, the hospital visitation rights that are endowed by these uh, bylaws, either the current one or the revised one. Do these apply outside of Arlington or outside of Massachusetts? In other words, what is the strength of this bylaw with respect to visitation rights? And then I have a second question after that one's answered. Sure. Uh, Mr. Heim, do you have an answer for Mr. Foskett's question? about uh, medical rights. Douglas Heim, Town Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Foskett for the question. Um, so let me just be clear that there's a couple of different things going on in the proposed amendments at once. Uh, one is to change some of the criteria for who and how you register for a domestic partnership. Um, there is a reciprocity provision. The legal boundaries of that reciprocity are not 100% Clear to me, to be frank. Um, there are other municipalities with uh, domestic partnerships that are similar to Arlington's, uh, including Somerville. Um, so it's uh, possible that the same domestic partnership rights would be extended to um, medical facilities in places with uh, reciprocity. I'm not 100% sure how another state would treat uh, Massachusetts domestic partnerships, I'm sorry, the town of Arlington domestic partnership. It's also further complicated by the fact that the state has its own definitions of domestic partnerships for different reasons. So um, the answer is not 100% clear. The attorney general's office, unfortunately, um, didn't provide as much clarity on that point as I would have um, liked. Uh, but um, I believe that was their intent in terms of trying to recognize that there are other municipalities that have a similar uh, domestic partnership uh, codified in, in, in their ordinances. Thank you, Mr. Heim. Mr. Moderator, may I ask a second question? Please, yeah. So um, this article removes the, requ removes the requirement that people in domestic partnerships not be married. And my question is, um, general law part four, chapter 272, section 15, deals with polygamy. Now, it says uh, that people who uh, marry but have um, also another marriage relationship uh, violate this law in, in layman's terms. Um, if there are two married people in a, in a domestic partnership, and they're not married to each other, are they violating uh, Chapter 272, Section 15 on polygamy? Mr. Heim, does Article 11, the main motion, violate uh, polygamy laws? Doug Heim, Town Council, not necessarily. Uh, this is a, I think everyone can appreciate, this is a particularly complicated posture. Um, the state is not recognizing domestic partnerships as we've defined them in Arlington as being the same as marriage. And they are not, um, they're also saying that Arlington's bylaw to date has not attempted to redefine marriage. Uh, that is uh, something that the attorney general's office has been very clear that they will not allow Arlington to do, which is to redefine a marriage. A domestic partnership, um, as defined under Arlington's bylaws, uh, can be compatible with the definition of marriage without rising to the level of polygamy uh, under the law. And I say that not with any uh, intent to disrespect the relationships that we're talking about here. I think some of what has been complicated for the town to try to contemplate is affording the dignity and respect to the relationships as we're discussing them 
while also trying to avoid conflicts with, with other laws? So the answer to that is uh, it's, it's not necessarily. Is it possible? Uh, under certain circumstances, yes, but I think what would have to be found is that that domestic partnership was for all intents and purposes uh, a marriage and that there were more than two people who were proceeding in a married relationship. Thank you. Uh, Thank Mr. You. Mr. Frosca, do you have anything else? Uh, yes. Um, I, I want to say that, first of all, I think um, uh, I am proud that the town has adopted this domestic partnership um, uh, bylaw either in the past or are proposing the current one. And I stand against the article in its entirety um, for, for some of the reasons that were brought up by other people, but also because I think in essence, it certainly violates chapter 272. And I don't believe that Mr. Heim has indicated that it does not. He just simply said that it may not. So for, for these reasons, I ask uh, people to vote against uh, Article 11. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Proskett. Uh, it's 935 uh, and we have a lot of speakers. Um, uh, this may, looks like there'll be a lot more debate on this uh, article and, and, the, and the amendment. Uh, so let's take a 10 minute break now and let's reconvene at 945. Thank you. Let's come back. Okay, can we uh, bring the uh, speaking queue back up? Okay, so let's take, take uh, Ms. Zhu next. Name and precinct, please. Hi, this is Emily Zhu, Precinct 1. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, um, so there's two angles here. There's what could go wrong and there's what could go right. Um, so I'll start with the first. In response to concerns of abuse, uh, I believe Cambridge has an ordinance on domestic partnerships that's been around for around a year now, and they do not require that partners live together or share living expenses. Um, and so far, nothing drastic has happened to my knowledge. And I just want to say if anything drastic were to happen, we do meet every year and we can address that. And I, I do believe that the actual, um, the likelihood and the impact of any possible abuse is very low. Um, and the cap of 12 weeks for parental and family leave applies regardless of the number of domestic partners you have or the number of children born or adopted and is not per child. So even if you have multiple partners who all have children in the same year, you still can't exceed those 12 weeks. Um, so just as we would support someone in a traditional marriage who has many children, or as we would support someone who has to take significant time off to care for a chronically ill family member, um, I think we should also be able to support multiple domestic partners. Um, uh, another point I wanted to address is that, yes, we do have hospital visitation for domestic partners as they are currently defined. Um, but this article would allow partners who don't live together to also have that benefit. And as others have said, there are many valid reasons why partners may not live together and yet still be in a genuine partnership. Um, so uh, now I'll move on to the what could go right. I think as opposed to the possible uh, concerns, um, which may or may not happen, the, the benefits of this article um, are, are tangible and would be very meaningful to the people that they apply to. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll stop there because many of people have like already said the points that I wanted to say, um, but I, I support this article 11 and I will be voting against the Moore Amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sue. Uh, let's take Ms. Mann next. Name and precinct, please. Good 
Nora Mann, Precinct 20. I think as most of you folks know, I'm rising in opposition to Article 11 and I shared my reasons in a statement um, that went out to town meeting members. I, I think everybody's had an opportunity to review, so I'm just gonna simply highlight a couple of points. Um, and then I am gonna respond very briefly to some of the comments that have been made. By way of background, I'm a lawyer. I have been a lawyer for 35 plus years, most of it in government service. And I have served as a regulator for a big chunk of that. I was also personally involved in a lot of the equal marriage decisions when I was working in the Attorney General's office. The choice to embark on polyamory is just that, it's a choice. It is not equivalent to a person having an immutable, immutable sorry, or unchangeable characteristic like race, sexual orientation, or disability, where the government must sometimes act to protect that person's right. In response to Ms. Ryan Vollmer, no one is looking for power over Mr. Meek's relationship. He and I had a very long and respectful conversation and I have no doubt that his relationship is important, valuable, and valued. And my opposition is not about fear, rather it's about the use of regulation in a way that follows the history of human and civil rights. And I know that there was probably a time when folks would have looked at equal marriage as something that was out of the norm. But there is a firm basis for expanding human and civil rights and there need to be definitions that are susceptible of application. I'm not convinced that polyamory or consensual non-monogamy needs, needs rather the recognition by government as a protected class, particularly with this expansive definition that's before us in Article 11. The dramatic expansion of the term domestic partner to include this wide range of consensual non-monogamous relationships dilutes the efforts to seek equity and fairness in behalf of historically marginalized and at-risk populations. The, in addition, this expansion may have the unintended consequence of turning currently supportive employers against expend, extending benefits to folks who are in committed relationships but have decl declined to formalize that with marriage. Last year, we approved a bylaw recognizing domestic partners with two or more people who share expenses, were in the same household, and are not married to someone else. I appreciate that Mr. Meeks has taken a lot of time to talk with me and uh, I respect the proponent's commitment to and the work done on behalf of this issue, but I believe they have gone too far. This proposal isn't a little tweak. It is a pretty radical change uh, that would eliminate the requirement that to enter into a domestic partnership, the partners must be, not be married to somebody else. In the time I have since I first read Article 11, I've done a lot of research about polyamory and looked at the work of the Chosen Family Law Center as well as the Polyamory Legal Advocacy Coalition. There is a great deal of support and advocacy for non-traditional or chosen families, and that is a good thing. I learned about child rearing and shared responsibility agreements and other contracts by and among the people in the polyamorous relationships. But seeking government rec regulation, recognition, and assurance of certain rights rights based on a vague and broad definition is neither necessary nor I believe is appropriate. And as a consequence, I urge a vote against Article 11. This is not based on fear. This is based on an understanding of an appropriate uh, expansion of regulation and the ability to apply that regulation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Mann. Um, Let's take Mr. Trembley next. A name precinct, please. I don't. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I can. cannot hear anything that's going on. I, uh, I, the last I two can... speakers have been unmuted. I don't know if anybody can hear me even. I, I can hear you and I've, I can hear the previous speakers. Um, I've talked to the question and answer and nobody seems to have any answers. And once, like I said, I can't tell whether anybody can even hear me. 
Uh, I can hear you now. Uh, name and oh, you can't hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, name, name and precinct. I can't. You'll have to type the question because I can't hear. Uh, my question is, Mr. Moderator. I think I'm woefully ignorant on even some basic stuff on this. Um, so one of the questions I have is, do, uh, do the people who are applying for this have to physically, all of them, show up in front of the uh, town clerk? Does one of them have to come? I really have no idea how this works. In the context of Article 11, or like the changes in Article 11, or more generally what we already have in the bylaws? We already have uh, mention of uh, partners' rights uh, for domestic partnership as of last year's town meeting. So, are you asking in general or specifically in the context of the changes in Article 11? I believe someone's just shared that in the chat with Mr. Trumbull. Mr. Trumbull, can you hear me? Uh, so, since we have uh, several speakers in the queue, uh, why don't we mute Mr. Tremblay and perhaps someone from um, IT can work with him to see if we can figure out uh, his connection issue um, and we can take other speakers uh, at the time. Let's see. Let's see, who's, does someone have a timer going off? Oh, actually, that, that was me. My, sorry about that. Um, so let, let's try to come back to Mr. Trembley if, uh, if someone can work, if IT can work out uh, his connection issues, please. So um, we can, yeah. So if Mr. Trembley, if you can hear me, uh, get back in the queue and we'll try to resume that. I mean, we do have rules about people being repeat speakers, but that doesn't really apply in this case because you had technical uh, um, problems. Uh, so let's take uh, Mr. Levy next. Name and precinct, please. Hi, David Levy, Precinct 18. Uh, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Matter, I move the question. I'll matter before it. Okay, we have a, uh, a motion to terminate debate uh, on the article and all matters before it, which, in, which means, the uh, in this case, the, the, uh, the more amendment. Um, uh, so let's, um, uh, open up, uh, the request to terminate debate. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Before we do it, do we have a second? I'm sorry. Okay. We do. We have a, a second, the first one from Mr. Hamlin. Okay. So we have a second to terminate debate. So let's, uh, open up voting uh, for termination of debate on the article and all matters before it. And before anyone starts voting, remember we're gonna be voting in waves to prevent the database from falling over. Um, and so if you're in precincts one through seven, once voting is uh, open, please vote on whether you want to terminate debate. Precincts one and seven only, and we'll go for 20 seconds. If you're in precincts eight and higher, please do not vote yet. We already have too many users connecting simultaneously. We're getting that error message, message so we might have had too many folks trying to vote at once. So let's please try to vote in waves. Only uh, one through seven now. Now, if you're in precincts eight through 14, uh, feel free to go ahead and, and vote now.
and we have a point of order and uh we're gonna have we're gonna try something different tonight uh we're gonna have uh mr feeney uh take the point of order we won't be able to see it on the screen uh because we're gonna have someone else from our um pr presenter here uh the display presenter actually taking the point of order uh so that we can still see the voting going on and if you're in precincts uh, 15 and higher, uh, feel free to vote now. Are we able to get uh, Ms. Uh, take the point of order from Ms. McKinnon? I see Ms. McKinnon uh, is now permitted to talk in Zoom. So Ms. McKinnon, yep, can you uh, name and precinct and uh, state your point of order, please? This is Sarah McKinnon from Precinct 20. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Um, I think I'm allowed to ask this as a point of order. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Moderator. Sure. Sure. Are we, um, just for clarity, are we voting to end all uh, conversation or debate on everything before us? So both the Moore Amendment and the um, uh, article itself? That's right. The, the main motion uh, defined by the like the uh, the main ar the, the the article and the select board's uh, recommended vote. Um, the it's termination of debate on the main motion associated with the article and uh, and the and the more amendment uh, altogether. So if we if we get a two thirds vote to terminate debate, we'll then proceed to uh, vote on the more amendment. And then we'll vote on the main motion associated with the article. Uh, if the this vote to terminate debate fails, then uh, we will continue debate and we'll go back to the speaking queue and folks can speak to either the more amendment or to the main motion of Article 11. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the clarification. Great, thank you. I'm trying to make it more clear uh, going forward when we do this. Um, it's always a little confusing when we have a subsidiary motion like an amendment. Um, um, so let me see how we're doing on voting. Um, we have 235 votes cast. We're still missing 17. Uh, there's, let's see, so three folks who've been active recently who I don't have votes for yet uh, are uh, Mr. Oster, Mr. Marshall, and Ms. Johnson, Claire Johnson. Uh, other folks have been inactive for some time. Okay, so now just, uh, okay, so let's just give Mr. Oster uh, 15 seconds and then we'll close voting. And this is for termination of debate on the main motion and the, all the, uh, and everything before it, which includes the, the Moore Amendment. Okay, five seconds. And let's close voting on the motion to terminate debate. Motion fails. Uh, I got 63.6 percent of the vote, and it needed 66 and two thirds uh, for termination of debate. So um, it was just a handful of votes short of termination of debate. So debate will continue. Um, so let's uh, just cycle through the screens, and then we'll go back to um, debate. And if you missed your precinct coming up on the screen, you can always, uh, uh, in the portal, you could always, on the left-hand side, there, uh, there's a, a column of buttons. You can click view votes and you can see any of the votes that, that we've done tonight or previous nights. Okay, so let's go back now to uh, debating article 11 and, uh, and the main, mo and, and the uh, uh, Mr. Moore's amendment.
Okay, so we're just trying to pull the uh, Article 11 back up and restore the, uh, the speaking queue. Okay. And let's say so. Okay, so we have, uh, did we already have Mr. Levy? I don't remember, um, or was that a previous article? Uh, let's, let's take Mr. Levy next. I might be thinking of the last article that he spoke. Uh, name and precinct, please. Uh, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, Mr. Moderator Dave Levy, uh, precinct 18. Hey, you. Um, uh, no, I, I would, I yield my time. My, uh, I motion to terminate debate, so I yield my time. Oh, you had the mo okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, let's take Ms. Stamps next. Well, thank you, Mr. Moderator, can you hear me? Yes, uh, name and precinct. Susan Stamps, precinct three, and as um, most people know, I was co-author of that letter to town meeting with Nora Mann. Um, I, I do come at this question as a, a attorney with 35 years, uh, doing uh, family law and um, I am not a fear monger and I do resent being called a fear monger, um, but I'll just proceed with what I wanted to say. Um, and also I, um, I was with Nora on that really great call we had with Amos Meeks last week where we went through every item um, that he was thinking about and that we were thinking about and, and we considered it a, a productive phone call. Um, when uh, Ms. Bomar, who was the first speaker, um, described the um, article of 11, I believe that she failed to mention two major components that would change in the bylaw, which were the um, two ways in which the definition of domestic partnership would be greatly expanded. Uh, currently under our bylaw article 23 of uh, the general bylaws of uh, title one, a domestic partnership is described as three or more people who you know live together and, and all that sort of thing. But this article 11 would expand that to um, that a domestic partner could be already registered in another domestic partnership or a domestic partner could be married to someone else. So you could conceivably have somebody who's in a domestic partnership who's already in three or four other domestic partnerships, um, is already married to um, somebody else. And the my research of domestic partnership laws across the country are all limited to two people and we're not arguing that tonight, but the idea has been to afford people who do not want to get married for whatever their reason is, the benefits of marriage. Um, but yet here we are expanding the definition of uh, domestic partnerships in ways that married people can't do. They can't be married to more than one person or in more than, uh, in, 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 cannot be, um, they can't marry somebody who's already married and they can't be in more than one marriage. Um, I would like to ask town council if my um, understanding of article 11 is correct, please. Which particular as I, as I just expressed it, the, the expanding the definition of okay. uh, domestic partnership. Um, Mr. Heim um, is, is Ms. Stamps, um, uh, description of the expansion of the definition of domestic partnerships accurate in Doug, article main motion. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Doug Hine, Town Council. To my understanding, correct. The definition of domestic partnership for Arlington's bylaws purpose uh, would be expanded in the manner she's described. Okay. Um, and if I may also ask um, Mr. Hine, if under our current domestic partnership bylaw, Article 23 of Title I, does that already extend to domestic partners the ability for uh, visitation in medical facilities and correctional facilities? Mr. Hine? 
Doug Heim, town council, thank you, Mr. Moderator. So yes, the current uh, domestic, for folks who currently qualify as domestic partners under the Arlington bylaw, those are two of the things that the bylaw specifically affords is access to domestic partners um, in, a, in a medical facility as well as um, in a jail or correctional uh, facility. All right. Is, um, is that, are you satisfied? Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And um, I just, you know, um, I went to law school with Mary Bonato and very supportive of gay marriage. This isn't about, this isn't about marriage. It's, it's about wanting to live together in a, um, in a loving family, which I completely support. I don't care how many people are in it. Um, I don't know how people can be in multiple marriage like relationships and partnerships and stuff and actually be able to do that, but it, I, it's not my place to judge that. Um, but I do worry that this is just an expansion of um, mar marriage like relationships, which over time will will start raising the issues of other kinds of employment benefits and other sorts of benefits which could become extremely expensive for employers, especially small employers. Um, and the Legal Advocacy Coalition, uh, the Polyamory Legal Advocacy Coalition, which um, has assisted in putting together this uh, warrant article, um, has describes on their website that they are looking for uh, people in domestic partnerships, these expanded domestic partnerships to end up with um, all, all, all the rights of marriage, essentially. Um, that's that's what I, all I had to say. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ms. Stamps. Uh, let's uh, take Ms. Dre next. Name and precinct, please. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 10. Um, it's been a lot of good discussion and I, it's generated some questions um, and I'll put them forth and you, Mr. Moderator, Mr. Moderator can decide who should answer. But um, one of the things that was brought up was this idea of choice, um, that this is not, um, that this is someone's choice. And so I'm wondering uh, what the proponents uh, might respond to that argument. Uh, Ms. Ryan Volmar, do you want to speak to choice, especially, and let's keep this within the scope of uh, Article 11, like choice in terms of entering into domestic partnerships that's relevant to this article? Um, Susan Ryan Volmar, Peace Precinct 19. I'm sorry, um, could you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, can, um, can you speak to uh, uh, prior assertions um, uh, earlier in, 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 in discussion tonight uh, uh, that uh, entering into domestic partnerships is a choice and therefore not akin to other protected classes that are more, I think the word was intrinsic maybe um, to an individual. I'm, I'm forgetting the exact language, but um, uh, can you, I, I think Ms. Dre's question is, can you speak to um, that, uh, those assertions made earlier tonight in terms of choice uh, entering and, and how that's different from other uh, types of protected classes. Um, Susan Ryan Volmar, Precinct 19. Um, I, I think the, the assertion that um, the proponents of Article 11 are seeking for people in polyamorous relationships to be treated as a protected class is a red herring. I don't, I don't think anyone has made that argument. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. I'm not sure either. Uh, uh, Ms. Dre, does, does, that, does that satisfy? Yeah, I, I guess it's my understanding then from uh, Ms. Um, Ryan Volmer is that that is not, that that's not a, a concern that she shares. Well, it, sound, it, it sounds like it, it wasn't a consideration that went into the drafting of this article, it sounds like. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm also sort of um, getting um, this feeling about, you know, that this is opening a Pandora's box. This is the wild, wild west. If we do this, then down the road, we're going to be doing something else. And so I'm wondering what um, Cambridge and Somerville have experienced um, since they have already passed 
something similar. Um, have they had fraud? Has there been pushback in their community against domestic partnerships? I don't believe we have any expert witnesses from Cambridge or Somerville tonight, but I can ask Mr. Heim if he happens to know, uh, since he just seems to know a lot of these sorts of things. Mr. Heim? Mr. Moderator, I'm sorry to disappoint, I do not. <laughs> Um, so I, 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 I don't know who to direct that to who's, uh, who's with us tonight. Um, may I make a suggestion, Mr. Moderator? Sure, sure. Well, I believe Mr. Mr. Meeks uh, worked in conjunction with a group on this that may, I'm just throwing that out there. Sure. Uh, if, uh, um, can we bring up Mr. Meeks uh, to address Ms. Dre's question about uh, precedent set in an experience that uh, uh, the cities of Cambridge and Somerville have uh, on their expanded definitions of domestic partnerships? Yes, uh, um, this, I'm here. This is Amos okay. Meeks, Precinct 3. Mm -hmm. um, I do not know directly. Um, I have been working with the Polyamory Legal Advocacy Coalition to, to help draft this, um, and they also help Somerville and Cambridge with their bylaws. I have, um, you know, brought up and, and passed along many of the concerns that others have brought up around fraud, things like that, to them. Um, and I expect that if anything like that had been, had occurred in Somerville or Cambridge, that they would have uh, brought that up, and they did not. Uh, so I suspect that nothing has happened. But um, ultimately, I would think I would have to reach out to the city clerks uh, there, um, uh, and I have not done that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Meeks. Ms. Dre, uh, anything else? Yes, thank you, Mr. Meeks. Um, since he's there, I'm wondering if he could, I wanted to thank him for his words earlier um, and for sharing his personal experience with all of us and trusting us with that. Um, I'm wondering why reciprocity matters. What is, why is that important to, to someone like Mr. Meeks? I hear that we have reciprocity with Cambridge and Somerville, and that's important. And maybe he can help me understand why. So, so you're asking like a question on like on a personal level to someone, not just like a legal level. Is that correct? Um, I, I guess whichever way you would like, Mr. Moderator. I'm I'm interested. I guess uh, legally, let's keep this legal. Yeah. Okay. So let's direct that to uh, redirect to Mr. Heim. Uh, what what is the relevance of reciprocity? Like, what 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 is the kind of the, the meaning of that in the law? So I'm uh, town council. So the idea behind reciprocity is that the rights and status recognized in Arlington would be recognized in another jurisdiction. Um, Arlington doesn't. Um, so that if there's if you were in a hospital, if you're at Winchester Hospital, uh, if you had reciprocity uh, with Winchester uh, on this particular issue, uh, one would. Uh, be, would safely assume that your domestic partnership, which is not, our definition of domestic partnership is not the same as the state's varying definitions of domestic partnership for different purposes and different laws. So you would, with reciprocity, uh, hope that another jurisdiction would recognize your rights. And that could be in neighboring Somerville or Cambridge, or it could be in somewhere in you know, Vermont or Florida or wherever uh, the thank same you. thing was other. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heim. I appreciate that. Just in the, uh, the time. I'm also just wanted to say um, that I believe it's true that when people uh, are take their 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 leave, um, they must use their own personal or vacation time. Um, and if that's all used up, then they have to use unpaid leave. So that will not cost the town more money. Um, thank you. I stand in support of the original motion and I will be voting against the more amendment. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hey, thank you, Ms. Ray. Um, let's take uh, Nick Pretzer next. Name and precincts, please. Hi, this is David Pretzer from Precinct 17. Um, as someone who has been in a domestic partnership, it makes me really proud that Arlington is sort of, you know, leading the way on this issue. And I think this article 
sort of continues to help Arlington lead the way. Um, I think it's really important. Um, you know, I, I, I once for work spent, uh, you know, needed to spend six months in another country. Um, I think it's important that someone who might have to spend time abroad for work or might, you know, be uh, for military, you know, but might be in a military, you know, unit and be stationed somewhere else. I think it's important that people in those sorts of situations don't have to worry that their domestic partnership might be called into question because they're temporary, temporarily unable to live in the same place as a partner. I think similarly, there are many reasons why people in a domestic partnership might either want or need separate checking accounts. There's definitely like legal situations in which separate finances might be advisable and required. And so I don't think either of those things should be a barrier to being in a domestic partnership. Um, I think people expressed concerns about fraud or people entering into domestic partnerships under false pretenses. I think it's really unlikely that that would be an issue in practice, but you know, even if there was some risk of that being an issue, I don't think we should restrict the rights of people in Arlington to enter into domestic partnerships um, because of concerns that you know, a few people could try to do something fishy. I think it's very unlikely that anyone's going to do something fishy with this law. And I think regardless, Arlington should stand at um, expanding and defending the rights of all the families that call Arlington home or that come to Arlington. Um, and I also think that given that many of us do go to hospitals in Somerville and Cambridge, reciprocity is also super important. So I encourage everyone to support the main mission and reject the more amendment. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Mix Pretzer. And I see Mr. Tremblay is back on the speaking list. This will not be a second uh, uh, speaking time for him, uh, so, which, which would kind of in, uh, trigger different rules. Uh, we'll consider this a continuation of his first speaking time. So I don't think we, we don't have the time recorded from his uh, the first part of his speaking slot. Um, um, but let, let's see if we can. Um, any questions Mr. Trumpley might have. Thank you, Mr. Uh, moderator, Ed Trumpley, Precinct 19. Um, hey, can, can you hear me now or no? Yes, I can. Uh, okay. the, there's problem, problems with my own speaker system. It got it. Okay. Glad we got it to quit today. Um, I was just curious if, if uh, the uh, people applying for domestic partnership all have to show up in front of Julie Brazil, or can just one of them one of them show up and uh, apply for the partnership? Right, so does um, uh, Ms. Brazil, a town clerk, or Mr. Heim, a uh, town council, want to take that? Uh, let, let's start with Ms. Brazil, since uh, you were called out in the question. Do, do, do folks applying for a domestic partnership go to the town clerk's office to do that? Uh, Julie Brazil, town clerk. Yes, um, at this point, uh, I definitely do require um, all of the members to appear in person um, and show ID, which is very similar to the process for completing the marriage intentions. Mr. Chambly, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Let's take uh, Mr. Kepline next. Uh, name and precinct, please. Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. Um, last time, I learned that equity is like equal without the equal part. And now we have domestic partnership without the domestic part. Um, so my objection is to the abuse of language and call it and redefining things to whatever you want. Um, back in the day, there were communes and that was fine. Any number of people lived together, um, shared in domestic responsibilities, you know, and it's, it's fine with me. Um, except they did live together and share domestic responsibilities. Uh, here, uh, we've got a definition of a redefinition of domestic partnership uh, without the sharing a domicile part. So uh, I think it sh you should redefine, call this a friends with benefits, uh, you know, legal and employment benefits, because essentially that's what the, the bar is. 
um there's the i don't know you know and i think friends ought to be able to visit Mr. Mr. Kepa, each other in the hospital Mr. Kepa, and, me, or the prison let, let, let me just uh let me just interrupt there for, for just a moment uh, when you use a term like friends with benefits, that has that, that has a, a, a prior meaning, uh, which is like not exactly appropriate for this discussion. I, I see what you're saying, like literally with those words, but uh, there's something implied by that that uh, uh, I, I think it is not um, it's not the level of civility that I want for this discussion. Oh, so, well, let's, OK, let's, call let's, it friendship let's... then instead of domestic okay. partnership, you know, friends who also get some legal and uh, employment benefits. And I'm not even worried about the cost of the employment benefits. Um, it's the abuse of language and, and redefining things to what you want. Mr. Heim said the Massachusetts Massachusetts wouldn't let Arlington redefine the, the word marriage. And I think this is what you're trying to do here with domestic partnerships. And I was told that Merriam-Webster says domestic doesn't even require a domicile, that it retains pertains to family, but on the other hand, Mary Webster also defines domestic partnership as either member of an unmarried cohabiting couple, especially when considered as to eligibility of spousal benefits. So there's a little cherry picking on, on Merriam Webster definitions. So um, I think you should replace the terms domestic partner with friendship and uh, or domestic partner with friend and uh, partnership with friendship and let let people uh, I mean I share house keys with friends if I you know if I get locked out you know that's great too uh, there's a lot of benefits to having friends um, or even living in a commune and um, God bless them so my my uh, my objection is to the abuse of language and redefining terms way out of scope. Thank you. Right. I'm against the article. Thank you. Uh, let's take uh, Ms. Brown next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This is Melanie Brown, Precinct 19. Um, I'm, I've, the, uh, the debate this evening has been very deep and interesting and moving on a number of levels. Uh, we have talked about things from whether it's appropriate uh, employee benefits, we've talked about the rights of access, but at the root of this, what we're really talking about is how people define their families. And that's the personal aspect that's sort of, in my opinion, being glossed over as we focus on these other issues about how much it's going to cost the town or not. Um, if you'll indulge me, Mr. Moderator, I would like to share a short story of a personal nature. Um, I mean, if, if it's related to... It is directly related to this issue, okay. yes. Okay. Go, go ahead. Um, people have been talking this evening about the fact that if people are not cohabitating within the same domicile, how can they be defined as being in a domestic relationship? I would like to point to my grandmother-in-law who was married for over 50 years to the same man. She loved and adored him desperately. They spent every day together of their lives, of their married lives, but they didn't live in the same household. In the early days of their marriage, they struggled mightily to maintain their relationship and stay a married couple. They separated. Grandpa Jack moved to a separate household, and all of a sudden, their marriage started to flourish, and it allowed them to stay married for 50 years. And because of that separation, because they were married, legally married, they maintained the protective rights under law granted to them by marriage, such that when my husband's grandmother was in the hospital dying, 88 years of age, Grandpa Jack was able to go to the hospital every single day and sit with her, just as he had gone to her house every single day to sit with her and going home to his own house every night thereafter. Grandpa Jack was able to be with the woman he loved 
even though he didn't live in the same household because the law recognized their marriage as legitimate. This is the type of protection we're talking about under a domestic partnership. The simple right for family to be there to support one another and to not have legal issues get in their way. In the terms of reciprocity, from what I understand as of everything that I've heard tonight, those residents in Arlington would be allowed under reciprocity with Cambridge and Somerville. Arlington has no hospital of its own. So for half this town, they're going to hospitals in Cambridge and in Somerville, Mount Auburn, Cambridge City, Somerville Hospital. This protection would allow them to visit their families in these hospitals that they're going to be going, that, that their family's likely to end up under these circumstances. If Grandpa Jack could see his wife every day as she lay dying, how can we deny anybody else that same level of access? I am for that reason voting against the Moore Amendment and voting in favor of Article 11. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Ms. Brown. Let's take Mr. Rosenthal next. Uh, name and precinct, please. Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. Um, Miss, Mr. Meeks introduced his comments by saying that he lives in a world of science. I too live in that world, so I tend to think things through on my own. So when there's an issue where people are strongly polarized on one side or the other, my position seldom aligns in, seldom is in com complete alignment with either side. And for that reason, the accusation of fear-mongering doesn't sit well with me. Now, when I first read Mr. Moore's amendment, it seemed to make sense, but unlike the other people Mr. Meeks uh, reports he spoke to, you know, his, Mr. Meeks' statement was successful in convincing me to vote against the Moore amendment. But I have a different concern. Let me start by saying that I believe strongly in equal treatment under the law. But to me, equal treatment under the law means not only equal rights, but also equal responsibilities. The institution of domestic partnership confers rights similar to those uh, that married spouses have. And as has been frequently mentioned here, one very important example is hospital visitation rights as a spouse. As I said, I think that's a very important right and I strongly support it. But this article states, and I quote, Nothing contained in this chapter shall be construed to impose liability upon a domestic partner for the health or medical expenses of their, uh, of their domestic partner. And to the best of my knowledge, nothing in any other body of law imposes such liability either. In contrast, it's state law that married couples are legally liable for their partner's medical expenses. I have no problem at all with domestic partners and married couples being tre treated equally. However, I do have a problem with domestic partners being afforded financial protections that are denied to married couples. So I would like to say that if the main motion does pass, I do hope that the supporters will advocate just as diligently in the future to change the law to provide the very same financial protections to married couples. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Let's take Mr. Dunn next. Uh, name and precinct, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dan Dunn, Precinct 21. Can you hear me, Mr. Moderator? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Many of you will remember my passionate support of this change last year. I don't have quite the same passion about these changes, but I support them. I support families and the love of the people in those families. We're used to nuclear families, the man, the woman, the boy, and the girl. We've learned that it's not that simple. Gender and love are complex things. I know that some people aren't comfortable with polyamory, but we're all comfortable with families. I'm not worried about the fraud or abuse. Should that fraud come to be, then we can come back to a town meeting and amend the law. I'm opposed to Mr. Moore's amendment. I support the main article. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, let's take Ms. Hyam next. Name and precinct, please. Leba Hyam, Precinct 15. I 
would like to move the to terminate debate and all matters before the article. We have a motion by Ms. Hyam to terminate debate on the article and all matters before it, um, which would mean the more amendment as well. Um, and do we have a second? We have a second from Mr. Hamlin. Um, okay, so let's open up uh, termination of the, uh, a vote on terminating debate. Uh, so, oh, that was quick. That was quicker than I thought. Uh, so only only precincts one through seven, please. Sorry, um, didn't catch that in time. Um, only precincts one through seven for now. I can give them 20 seconds. Um, if you're in precincts eight or higher, please don't vote yet. Okay, and so precincts uh, eight through 14, please go ahead and vote. If you're in precincts 15 and higher, please do not vote right now. And this is, we're voting on whether to terminate debate on the main motion for article 11 and the more amendment as well. And, and so if this passes with a two thirds vote, then debate will be terminated and we'll proceed to voting on first the amendment and then the main motion. If this vote fails, then we will continue debate. Um, so vote yes, if you want to end debate and get to voting on the article and the, and the amendment, uh, the, the main motion and the amendment, um, vote no, if you want to continue debate. Uh, let's see. We still have a, we have a number of missing votes. I don't know if that's because folks are having trouble, uh, like technical issues with voting, or um, or folks just have been slow to vote. Um, okay, now we're up to two hundred and fourteen votes. Um, two twenty two. The pace has picked up. Um, some folks who have not voted yet, but who have been active very recently, are uh, oh, that just dropped significantly. That's good. Uh, so. Uh, Mr. Marshall, Mr. Rudiman, uh, Mr. Mills, uh, Mr. Brown, Ms. Brown, uh, Ms. O'Brien. Uh, so let's give folks just another 20 seconds to vote. Um, apologies for the uh, kind of indeterminate time of voting um, because of the technical issues we've had and the waves of voting slows things down. Um, let's just give another 10 seconds. Mr. Ruderman, uh, Mr. Brown. Okay, let's close voting and let's see. And we do have, a, and after we close voting, we do have a point of order from Ms. Weber. Let's see, so Mr. Feeney, are you able to, um, pull up that point of order while we keep the voting on the screen here so we don't have a um, the complexity of having to juggle both from the same um, from the same window. Uh, Ms. Weber, uh, can you unmute and uh, give us your name and precinct and tell us your point of order? I just want to know it, you never seem to announce precincts um, eight to twenty one. I mean. Not not eight to twenty one, fifteen to twenty one. You always announce the other two, and then the last section doesn't seem to have as much time to vote. And that's why at the beginning mm -hmm. we didn't have a lot of votes because you hadn't announced the last seven precincts. That's all. Right. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I apologize if I missed announcing that. I I think I did announce eight. I, it is true that eight through. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, fifteen 15. to twenty one do get less time. I, I can try trying to kind of mix that up uh, so we have more uh, kind of parity um, uh, by mixing up uh, one, one article after another. Um, 
Thanks for the feedback. Okay, so let's close voting now. And this is the motion to terminate debate and debate is terminated. Um, 204 uh, in the positive, 28 in the negative. Um, and we've exceeded the two thirds uh, threshold needed to terminate debate. So let's cycle through the screens here. It's 1040 PM. Uh, this, we should have sufficient time to get through voting on the first, the more amendment and then the uh, the main motion. So let's just cycle through the screens. And if you miss your precinct on these screens, because they do go by quickly, you could always uh, click the view votes button on the left hand side of your portal. We get through. Okay, so let's now uh, hold on. Uh, just had to re sign in into the portal. Hold on a second. Okay, so let's now open up voting on uh, the Moore Amendment for Article 11. This is the majority vote. Oh, and uh, before we get into that, actually, uh, we do have a point of order from Ms. Dre. So why don't we take that before we get into voting? Uh, Mr. Feeney, do you want to take that? So we, or, or Ms. Wayman, do you want to do it while you have this up here? Apologies, uh, Mr. Moderator, Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 10. I apologize, that was an error. Oh, okay. Okay, let's get back to voting on, uh, thank you. Uh, let's vote on, um, open up voting on the Moore Amendment. And so Mr. Moore's amendment, uh, you would vote yes on this if you want to retain the requirement that we currently have in the bylaws that domestic partners live together and share living expenses for the purposes of rights to benefits. So, so precincts one through seven, please vote. If you're in precincts eight or higher, please do not vote yet. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll switch up the other two waves uh, so we have a little more equity there. Uh, okay, and now uh, precincts, let's go with um, uh, uh, 15 to 21. Please vote. And if you're in precincts eight to 14, uh, please hold off for just a little bit. And now if you're in precincts uh, eight to 14, please vote. And so if you, are in favor of retaining the requirement in the town bylaws that domestic partners live together and share living expenses for the purposes of rights to benefits, uh, please, you should vote yes. If you, if you don't wanna change the main, emo the main motion uh, in that regard and um, you want the main motion to drop those requirements of the definition of domestic partners, then you'll want to vote no on the Moore Amendment. So we have uh, 291 votes cast. We have just a few remaining uh, outstanding. So uh, Ms. O'Brien, Mr. Grunko, Mr. Stern, and Mr. Brown, um, who've been active recently in the portal but have not voted yet. Um, I'll give you 15 seconds to finish voting. Okay, let's let's close out voting. And this is for the Moore Amendment on Article 11. And the motion fails. The uh, uh, the 
mo the, the motion to amend fails. I'll run through the screens here. That means that next up, after we're done cycling through the precinct screens, we'll uh, take a vote on the main motion without any amendments. It will be unamended. Um, And again, if you've failed to uh, uh, to see your precinct in time as the screens uh, cycle by, you could always view votes in the portal. Uh, there's a view votes button on the left side uh, there. So let's just finish out uh, these precincts. Okay, so let's now open the main motion for Article 11. Um, so this is, so this will not be amended. This is the, the main motion. Um, and hold off on voting till I call your precincts. I'll change up the order this time again. Um, so this time we'll start with precincts 15 to 21. Please vote first. If you're in the highest precincts, 15 to 21, please go ahead and vote. If you're in the lower precincts, please do not vote yet. And a yes vote here means that you want to expand the definition of domestic partnership in the town bylaws for the purpose of extending partners' rights to benefits to more types of partnerships. Uh, you would vote no if you want to retain the status quo in the definition of domestic partnership uh, in the town bylaws for partners' rights to benefits. Okay, so uh, now let's go with uh, precincts uh, eight to 14. Please go ahead and vote. They're having some load issues on the server again. So eight to 14, please vote. I'm getting a connection issue with a delay. So yeah, just like you're seeing here. Um, so precincts one through seven, please do not vote yet. So we can keep the load uh, down on the server. Apologies for these technical disruptions. Precincts one through seven, uh, please hold off on voting right now. And also, uh, uh, if, any, if anyone is refreshing your entire browser window, or like your, your browser tab or window, um, I highly discourage that. Um, please allow the timeout, like if there's a timeout that's like a, a countdown like in, uh, in your browser, please wait for that to finish. Um, if you hit, if you force the page to refresh, uh, it increases load on the server and contributes to this problem. So pre six one through seven, please still hold off while we're still having these connection issues. Okay. Yeah, we only have 115 votes cast. Uh, that's like roughly half. So. Um, Let's hold off on precincts one through seven a bit, a little bit longer until things settle down here. And so this is a vote on the main motion of Article Eleven. Uh, vote yes if you want to expand the definition of domestic partnership in the town bylaws for the purpose of extending partners' rights to benefits to more types of, of partnerships. Vote no if you want to retain the status quo in the definition of domestic partnership in the town bylaws uh, for partners' rights to benefits. Okay, so now precincts one through seven, please go ahead and vote. Sorry for the delay on that. And so, let's see. Still missing votes from, let's say, about 40 folks. 
uh, who have been active relatively recently. So let's hold vote again. I apologize uh, for all these delays and having to keep voting open for so long, but I want to make sure the vast majority of people, uh, if, if not all folks who are still actively participating in the meeting are able to vote. Um, So all precincts should be voting right now. Again, please do not hit the, the refresh on uh, button in your browser. Please wait for the timer to count down uh, uh, within, within the page because it, it will reload on its own. Uh, and so while we're waiting for those, the last uh, set of votes to come in, there's still uh, over 20, active participants who have not voted yet. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just reiterate what the yes and no votes mean. If you, if you want to vote yes, if you want to expand the definition of domestic partnerships in the town bylaws for the purpose of extending partners' rights to benefits to more types of partnerships, and you would vote no if you want to retain the status quo in the definition of domestic partnerships uh, in the town bylaws for partners' rights to benefits. And I'm just looking at the numbers here and I'm just making sure that everything is adding up. So just give me a second, as far as like the vote totals. Okay, and we're still, uh... And we're, yeah, we're getting a lot of uh, votes, uh, not through the portal, but by other means. So it's taking us a little bit longer to tally that. Apologies again for those technical issues and the delays here. Um, Uh, and while we're waiting for these last votes, um, uh, we have a point of order from Ms. Weber. Um, Mr. Feeney, can you bring up uh, Ms. Weber's point of order, please? And Ms. Weber, um, when you're able to unmute, uh, just tell us your name and precinct and your point of order. Hi, Janice Weber, Precinct 21. I just got in touch with Julie, but... Um, my my screen in the portal never refreshed. It just stayed on the amendment. It never went to the article. And it's happened oh, a couple of times, but I did get through to Julie finally. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for reporting that. We'll uh um we'll have someone look into that and figure out if that's you know why that's happening and whether that's a widespread problem and what we can do about that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I still have outstanding uh, votes from uh, Ms. Anderson, Ms. O'Brien, uh, Mr. Brown, and yeah, and there's a few others, but they've been idle for some time. So for almost, a, uh, for around an hour or more. So, uh, so let's just get, again, apologies that this is taking so long. So make sure that, uh, that we get an accurate vote here. Um, okay, so let's just give another 20 seconds and then we'll close voting. That's almost everybody at this point. Again, uh, Elizabeth O'Brien, Michael Jacoby Brown, Mark McCabe. Uh, if you haven't voted yet, please vote for the next five seconds. You could, you could use the, uh, the Q&A, you can call um, uh, Ms. Brazil. 
Okay, so let's call this, let's close voting on Article 11. And the motion passes. And this is the unamended motion. It was not amended um, by the Moore Amendment. Um, okay, so let's go through all the screens here. And uh, thanks for everyone's patience and forbearance on the technical issues. We'll be looking into that further to see if there's further mitigations that we can put in place. There were mitigations put in place um, over the weekend. Uh, it seems like the, the, those mitigations did not entirely hold tonight, unfortunately, and I apologize for that. We'll, we'll see what we can do going forward. Okay, so we've been through all the screens. Uh, it is now uh, 10.56, almost 10.57, uh, let's see. Mr. Uh, Moderator? Yes, Mr. Foskett, please. I move we adjourn. Okay, do we have a second? Mr. Foskett uh, is moving to adjourn. Do we have a second? Uh, um, oh, before we get to that, before we get to that, we do have a point of order that I'm seeing uh, from Mr. Warden. Can we bring Mr. Warden up and see if we can quickly resolve that um, before we get back to that motion to adjourn? And also, while we're waiting for no, uh, here, here I am, Mr. Yeah. Moderator. Yeah, name and precinct. And John, your Warden, John Warden, precinct eight. Mr. Moderator, you didn't announce the vote numbers for either the amendment or the final thing. I think those of us who can't read the screens that quickly would like to hear those numbers. As to okay, I, I can do that for sure. Um, th th thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, Ms. Brazil, do you can you um, uh, can you announce the vote totals? And I apologize. Um, Thank you, Mr. Warden, for pointing that out. I'll try to remember to do that in the future. Yes, okay. uh, Julie Brazil, uh, town clerk. Uh, the amendment uh, failed, 59 votes, yes, 171 votes, no, nine abstentions. The main motion passed. 162 yes votes, 68 no votes, nine abstentions. Great, thank you, Ms. Brazil, and thank you, Mr. Warden. And actually, before we adjourn, uh, also, do we have any, uh, let, let's uh, enable raise hands in Zoom. Does anyone have any uh, motions uh, or, or any, any notices of reconsideration? I don't see the raised hand thing here. Are the, the raised hands there. up? Okay. Um, so if you have any, if you voted, which it means on the three articles that we passed tonight, or um, that we voted on tonight, they happened to pass. Uh, let's see. Uh, if you voted on the pre prevailing side, which is to say if you voted yes on any of those articles, because they're all, all voted yes, um, and you, if you want to give notice that you might want that, uh, article to be reconsidered uh, at a future meeting, uh, now is your chance before you adjourn tonight. Like for instance, if, if you suspect there might be new information that might come out that might change your vote, you can um, give notice, you, you can give notice of reconsideration tonight and we will uh, record that. Ms. Brazil will record that as town clerk and uh, it, that will give you the right to, to move to reconsider that uh, that article at a future meeting in light of new information. So if anyone, if, any, if there any, anyone wants to raise their hands to give notice of reconsideration, now is your last chance to do it in the next uh, 10 seconds. Five seconds. Okay, so seeing none, um, we had a motion from Mr. Foskett to adjourn. Uh, do we have a second? 
Are these, uh, can someone verify that these are new seconds and not uh, old seconds? I don't see any seconds now. Uh, Ms. Wayman, uh, do you know what the status of the seconds is? Are, are we resetting that? Okay, so we have a second uh, from Mr. Miller on the motion to adjourn. Um, and so we are adjourned for the evening, right, at 11 p.m. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we will be coming back on uh, Wednesday, May 4th at 8 p.m. Uh, thanks, everyone. and. Uh, um, enjoy your next two days.